Hello boys and girls and welcome to another episode of one-on-one -on -one interviews, interviews about physical performance. Today I welcome you at my home because we are recording it uh, during month of May in 2020 and we are still uh, in quarantine due to coronavirus. So that's the reason why today I'm gonna be both host and the guest of this show but uh, I'm not gonna answer to uh, questions that I have prepared but uh, I asked for help uh, from my friends and colleagues from strength and conditioning world and they uh, prepared some questions for me. Uh, I can use uh, right away a chance to present uh, those six guys. Uh, two of them you know very well because they were guests right here. Uh, Kostas from CSK and Reggie from Maccabi Tel Aviv. Uh, then my future uh, guests uh, I can uh, name also. Uh, my great friend Marin Dadic from uh, Croatia, uh, who is currently working in uh, be a training company where we uh, grew up together when it comes to strength and conditioning job. Then uh, Staska, uh, young Lithuanian strength and conditioning coach who I had privilege to mentor two times in uh, Croatia and Basconia. Then Alejandro, strength and conditioning coach of Lokomotiv Kuban, originally from uh, Spain. And last but not least, Thomas, uh, who you know probably uh, from uh, some of our uh, projects that we did together. Just recently uh, we did uh, a pro project uh, with his partner Sam Refsin from Sacramento Kings uh, and they are doing a great job by sharing their knowledge all over the world, especially uh, in Europe. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to be answering their questions and I hope you will uh, enjoy this episode. We are coming back soon. Okay, let's start with the first question from Thomas. Uh, number one, uh, what is your biggest motivator? What drives you to go above and beyond uh, in what you do? You know, not just taking care of the players, but, you know, um, writing your book, um, digging into the research, all the projects that you've been doing, just going above and beyond of what is expected. And I uh, would love to hear what's your biggest motivation behind that. Thanks. Well, I think like everyone, uh, I'm driven by both some internal and external factors. And I think the majority of motivation should come from, from the inside. And uh, what I like about my job and, and just being uh, in the sport environment and surrounded by athletes and coaches, uh, it just gives me a, a great... Uh, emotions and, and positive uh, vibrations uh, so to say and uh, this competitive environment of, of sports is something that uh, really resonates uh, with my character. Uh, I'm a person who likes to set both short-term and, and long-term goals and this competitive environment uh, keeps me motivated uh, and reminds me of uh, my character and on a daily basis when I see successful athlete uh, trying to become better uh, it also motivates me uh, and reminds me of who I am and who I want to be and just uh, gives me motivation to do research to do different projects and uh, also I uh, there is a term in, in sports psychology uh, named uh, achievement motivation and it's uh, based on uh, achieving goals uh, and keeping them as uh, as a motivation and i'm uh, a guy who likes to put every uh, goal doesn't matter if it's a daily goal or, or a goal for uh, next three years i like to put it on on paper and once i achieve it i like to uh, check it or i like to cross it uh, just to have that uh, again uh, good emotions uh, behind my achievements of course uh, on the other hand I'm also motivated by some external factors and uh, one one external factor that keeps me very motivated are uh, successful people who I like to uh, investigate and one of the channels where I found uh, tons of great people uh, was uh, is a channel of uh, Evan, Car uh, Evan Carmichael 
uh, called top, top 10 rules for success and I suggest it to everyone who is into uh, knowing a little bit more uh, what is actually behind successful people and uh, just watching those uh, interviews uh, where people talk about uh, what brought them uh, success and what they uh, think that it's important in order to be um, highly motivated and highly successful and productive uh, is something that uh, resonates with me and always give me a, a kind of push on a daily uh, basis. Uh, of course, uh, I have to say, uh, and I have to be honest, that in, in the last couple of years, uh, a lot of people, especially young strength and conditioning coaches, are reaching me through, through social media, and especially uh, after publishing the latest book, and uh, helping them a little bit, uh, talking to them, and uh, uh, having their appreciation for my time and effort that I devote to talk to them and discuss certain topics is definitely uh, another important piece of uh, motivation that uh, uh, pushes me forward to, to produce more and to give more. Another question, uh, it's a similar one, so uh, it's uh, made from Thomas and also from uh, Alejandro, so uh, I will play both of them and then I will give an answer. If you have to choose one moment of your career that uh, was a game changer for you in order to help you to achieve um, what you have right now, where you are right now, which one it will be? And Thomas? Uh, the second question is, would there be any defining moment in your career? I I'm sure there's uh, quite a lot, but could you recall up one defining moment that changed your perspective or changed your philosophy in some sort of way uh, from that moment on? Well, I think a, a lot of coaches uh, might start their own careers and then they would work for two, three, four, five years and then maybe something would happen, maybe they would find a, a main mentor finally or they would start working for a uh, different uh, company or different club and that that would uh, change their uh, th their approach to work or uh, that would be a great game changer for them uh, honestly uh, during my career I haven't had uh, any crucial moment that kind of changed the path uh, where or that I'm following uh, because uh, basically when I have decided to become a strength and conditioning coach, I think uh, the, the real game changer for me was knocking on the door of my uh, mentor at that time. Uh, his name is Luka Milanovic, currently a professor at the University of Zagreb and also he is a strength and conditioning coach of national football team of uh, Croatia. And uh, when I was still a student, I knocked on his door and I asked for help in a way that I was looking for an internship position and uh, he arranged me uh, f my first internship which was kind of a job, full-time job, uh, where I was strength and conditioning coach of basketball club uh, Zagreb junior uh, team. In that year uh, we had on our junior team Mario Hezonja and Dario Šaric, so you can imagine how much I enjoyed uh, uh, my work. Uh, so. Uh, I think that was a game changer because uh, there was a person who I was able to uh, consult about any of my doubts. Uh, he was the guy who would prepare uh, books to read, who would give me uh, different uh, assignments and tasks. And uh, later on when we started to work together in the national basketball team and later on I used to work uh, for a couple of years in his private company. Uh, it was just a, a normal path that I, I was following. I was on, on right tracks and then from there on uh, I just uh, had an opportunity to, to work uh, in with elite athletes in, in different sports and also he was always very supportive about my uh, work in basketball. He was uh, a person who uh, introduced to me uh, Joke Vrankovic 
ex-national uh, team coach who I went with uh, to Turkey and uh, basically from, from there on uh, it was just a, a normal uh, path towards uh, being now in Basconia and that's why I, I cannot say that there was a game changer throughout my career but early in my career when I think the game changer back when I was a student was the decision to uh, knock on the door of uh, Luka Milanovic. Next question is related to hardest part of, of our job. So let's hear it. Reggie. Luca, my guy. Finally, I have the opportunity to ask you questions. You keep asking us questions and now it's our turn. So my first question to you would be, my friend, is what do you think is the hardest part of our jobs? Well, I think uh, there is nothing really hard about strength and conditioning job. Uh, on the contrary, uh, everything is, is pretty easy. Uh, I cannot complain. I'm not an old guy who is uh, suffering while traveling. Uh, I'm not a big guy who is 210 and cannot sit normally on the plane or on the bus. Uh, so there is basically nothing really hard about the job, but by choosing the career of strength and conditioning coach might be hard in, in, in different ways. If you, I'm a guy who has a lot of friends in, in Croatia and I'm uh, also a family guy who has uh, two sisters and, and mom back in Croatia and uh, probably for me this is the, the hardest part of uh, being a strength and conditioning coach in a foreign country. Uh, and I definitely miss a lot my, my friends and family. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, one of the greatest challenges and the hardest parts when it comes to daily work is uh, pushing ourselves out of the comfort zone. Why I'm saying this? Because uh, in, in last, this is the first time in Basconia uh, that I'm staying in one place more than a full year, full season. And uh, what I could realize is that uh, in, in certain fields of my, uh, of my work, uh, you can easily uh, get trapped in, in the comfort zone. So for example, uh, you set in the first year recovery methods that you would like to do, and then in the second and third year, you just stick to the plan. I'm not saying it was like that, but I'm just giving an example where you sometimes you forget to be uh, uh, innovative or uh, to come up with, with new things, to change a little bit dynamics. It doesn't have to be really innovative, it doesn't have to be something new, but just to change a little bit how you work in the gym, uh, how you approach uh, every team warm-up, uh, how you uh, behave uh, and act with players during uh, traveling and so on. So I think uh, the greatest uh, challenge and it's not the hardest part but if you are the guy who wants to be uh, successful and who wants to be out of the the comfort zone you have to find a way how to be outside of it and and that's one of the greatest challenges so that might be something that it's really hard when it comes uh, to my job next question is from Staska and it is related to creating a buy-in. You have worked with many professional athletes and I'm wondering how do you create a buy-in with those highest level athletes? Thanks for question Staska. Uh, I think creating a buy-in uh, is basically the most important thing uh, when it comes to uh, our work uh, not only players buying but uh, coaches buying but okay uh, here we will focus more on on players i think uh, bonding with players and and uh, earning their trust is the most important thing because without trust between uh, myself and players we cannot really uh, expect that we will have uh, efficient uh, work. 
so what I always try to look for when I'm meeting a player for the first time uh, I try to be alone so for example when we have first day of preseason uh, I will either go to locker room and see if a new player who I don't know uh, is there uh, personally sometimes like we will sign we would sign the player during the summertime I would get in touch with the player talk over the phone but the first uh, uh, personal experience uh, with that new player I prefer to be alone just to uh, control uh, the whole environment uh, and uh, just to be f focused on on the presence of that uh, player so uh, during the preseason when I meet players for the first time as I said I like to be uh, alone uh, with players and uh, starting point for me is uh, always not talking about strength and conditioning uh, so I always try to avoid uh, questions even like on the first day only if player asks something uh, from me like for example the first day of preseason player might ask about supplements or uh, uh, some piece of equipment that he likes to use but uh, usually I'm not the one who starts the conversation about specific topics uh, I like to start conversation just by uh, asking about uh, player accommodation uh, where he lives at the moment if his family is coming or, or they already came together with him if he needs any help regarding uh, accommodating himself or uh, help around uh, town maybe uh, uh, suggesting some restaurants or places to eat uh, and so on so the, this is my first starting point because uh, I first want to connect on the uh, normal uh, level which is uh, more like personal and then later on we will try to uh, talk about uh, strength and conditioning uh, when it comes to a real strength and conditioning there is also something that I, I try to not follow always but uh, for what I learned from my experience is that uh, certain issues that uh, players had and some uh, like ma major or minor issues maybe some surgery uh, on low back or knee or just like uh, knee tendinopathy as a minor issue might be uh, a good uh, start point for a conversation so you might ask a player uh, if he had some uh, uh, issues last season uh, that he wants to uh, continue to uh, work on during our preseason and uh, I think it's always important to offer your help uh, rather than uh, saying okay you will do this and you will do that and and try uh, start acting bossy uh, from there on uh, step by step I try to uh, explain uh, a little bit the idea why I think some things are important uh, in our daily work uh, I always try to explain why we uh, prepare for strength session in that way why we uh, follow these kind of lifts uh, I try to explain a little bit also uh, what kind of uh, uh, things we try to incorporate when it comes to recovery and uh, which methods I prefer and I also try to ask uh, about players experience with different uh, recovery methods so I can learn a little bit more about a player and uh, in the end I think uh, creating a bind is uh, asking a lot of questions a lot of simple questions and just listening to uh, the answers next question is related actually to our work and comes from Reggie Hey Luca, my other question would be, what do you think is the best tool to predict muscle and soft tissues injuries? Nice, great question. Uh, I think uh, there is no perfect tool and we will never have a perfect tool uh, that will uh, predict uh, muscle or soft tissue injuries. There is always some kind of mix of, of different methods. I think... Uh, First, by knowing players' injury history is definitely one of the most important things uh, because previous injury uh, can tell you a lot about uh, 
players predisposition to get injured so i think that's a good starting point just simple uh, questionnaire about previous injuries is uh, uh, something that is definitely very 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 helpful in uh, injury uh, reduction then uh, i think we have to always follow players uh, current uh, well-being or level of soreness so either if like you can use a wellness questionnaire uh, to monitor players fatigue soreness uh, sleep quality and so on or uh, you can just uh, simply ask if players feel sore uh, soreness can often uh, mean that players are a little bit overloaded and by knowing what is ahead of us uh, we can act accordingly uh, so uh, if player feels uh, tight hamstrings on Wednesday after two days of practices and one strength session that was pretty hard uh, and then we play the next game on Thursday uh, I think we have to do something uh, regarding that soreness uh, or try to help the player on that Wednesday afternoon and evening and then on the game day uh, so player can can feel a little bit better both physically and and mentally and of course I oh, truly believe that uh, we should use objective data when it comes uh, to uh, predicting uh, injuries uh, I think one of uh, the good things is just tracking the chronic load of uh, each player on the team doesn't matter if it's based on uh, SRP method or it's based on micro technology or GPS in in outdoor sports uh, also uh, we should uh, use acute chronic workload ratio i think even though there are some uh, debates nowadays about uh, the effectiveness i think it's it's pretty useful uh, also we had a good uh, research from kathleen weiss and her colleagues on acute chronic uh, workload ratio and injury occurrence in basketball in professional basketball so it was kind of study that uh, that for me gave more strength to the ideas of team gabbet and from my personal experience uh, in the last three four years i am really focused uh, to load monitoring and management and it uh, showed me pretty pretty uh, solid uh, data about being uh, prone towards injury when the uh, acute chronic ratio is either too high or either uh, too low of course uh, we should also use tests for muscle strength and muscle flexibility uh, so any kind of uh, test using a dynamometer uh, could be pretty useful and some kind of uh, sudden drops in muscle strength could indicate uh, players fatigue uh, because sometimes players might not feel very sore in their for example hamstrings but they will show uh, a poor strength on on uh, strength tests so uh, this might be uh, useful same as the flexibility test now uh, there is another question from first one from Marin and it is about using machines Luca I know that your favorite machine in the gym is chest press because you want to have a chest like Arnold Schwarzenegger but believe me my friend that's a mission impossible so uh, I want to ask you what is your opinion about uh, working on machines with the professional athletes and do you use machines in your training protocols and strength training program thank you Marin uh, well first I think we have to uh, make a, a short definition or we should differentiate a different type of machines uh, there are machines such as uh, kaiser machine or roman chair uh, and those machines are very very useful uh, and then on the other hand we have more like fitness industry type of uh, machines uh, for a shoulder press a chest press some rows uh, even including uh, leg curls and leg extensions and I think uh, those kind of machines that are kind of old school fitness industry uh, type of machines 
should in general be avoided uh, when it comes to uh, healthy athletes strength and conditioning uh, program uh, however uh, using uh, machines such as uh, knee extension or uh, uh, hamstring curl machine during some kind of rehab or prehab program uh, might be very very useful uh, for example players who go through uh, rehab process of uh, hamstring tear definitely uh, using uh, uh, knee curl or hamstring curl machine is useful uh, because they can gain their strength uh, they can uh, load it concentrically uh, with both legs and then uh, maybe uh, use it in the eccentric phase only on one leg uh, it's very controlled range of motion uh, and i think uh, it could be beneficial uh, especially to uh, develop some some kind of hypertrophy uh, and bring some uh, muscle mass back on that injured leg uh, also i think uh, knee extension knee extension machine uh, is very useful uh, machine when it comes to uh, knee tendinopathy uh, isometric work and uh, combined with uh, electro stimulation of muscles could be something very 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 uh, beneficial uh, when it comes to knee tendinopathy prehab uh, when it comes to uh, work with healthy athletes i'm not saying that it should be forbidden but it generally it should be avoided especially if we are talking about elite basketball where we don't have a lot of time uh, to be in the gym uh, in general I try to avoid machines even though we have it uh, in the corner for rehab guys uh, and I think uh, we can use it and uh, a couple of months ago I was watching uh, a podcast with uh, Corey Schlesinger and uh, he was uh, saying uh, that it might be actually useful uh, to do, for example, uh, hamstring curls uh, before you do uh, trap bar deadlift because you will prepare those hamstrings uh, in, a, in a really, really uh, good way uh, so your deadlift can be even more powerful uh, and, and uh, just uh, uh, executed uh, in a, with a better uh, movement mechanics. Also, uh, hitting uh, hamstring curl before basketball practice uh, might be uh, pretty useful for uh, deceleration movements because uh, hamstrings will be uh, activated well and, and uh, definitely the decelerations and changes of direction uh, might be even more successful. Also players sensation of being more activated uh, is something that we can uh, very often see uh, and experience and if player says that he feels better more comfortable and more activated uh, after using uh, a certain machine uh, I will never uh, say anything against it however uh, machines in general uh, should be avoided uh, when it comes to uh, uh, general strength and conditioning program that's my opinion and I think uh, there should be they should be used in a specific moments and they should always supplement uh, exercises such as trap bar deadlift split squats Bulgarian squats and and so on another question and then we'll make a short break preseason conditioning question from Costas My last question is a little more technical. Uh, I would like to know how you go about preseason training, uh, you know, especially conditioning. What are the methods that you guys use? How do you decide on the load? And generally, how you handle this uh, very stressful part of the season? Thanks, Costas. So for me, uh, the most important factor when it comes to preseason conditioning is actually the head coach because uh, different head coaches have different uh, philosophies and different approaches during the preseason some of the uh, head coaches like to spend a lot of time uh, outside because it's preseason so we will have a lot, a lot of basic conditioning uh, which is uh, far away from uh, being on the court 
and far away from uh, developing conditioning through uh, competitive games such as 2 on 2, 3 on 3, 5 on 5. Uh, on the other hand, I also worked with coaches who told me, I don't want to go out, I don't want to do anything basic. Uh, we had enough of the off season period to do basic runs. From the first day, we will focus more on specific and competitive conditioning. Uh, just to be clear about the terminology, for me, specific conditioning is everything what is done on the basketball court by uh, doing basketball movements with or without the ball. And then competitive conditioning is basically the same thing, but incorporates a competitive uh, environment where actually players compete against each other. Uh, so in, in, in any case, I try to adjust to uh, our head coach and then uh, we will sit together and, and see how to do it. I think uh, in general, in the first week or ten, first 10 days of the preseason, especially if we are talking about Spain, where the weather in August is usually uh, very sunny, uh, I like to go a couple of times out. It doesn't have to be uh, very hard uh, conditioning sessions. Uh, it doesn't have to be high intensity intervals, especially if, sorry, if uh, basketball practices are hard enough, but we can use it for some uh, recovery running, we can use it for some uh, speed agility work uh, in the sand, uh, we can use it on a on day off uh, just to run a little bit in the woods and maybe do some uh, proprioceptive and light uh, body weight strength work there. Uh, in general, maybe outdoor uh, training can be used for different things, not always only for, for conditioning. Uh, however, it lasts only seven to 10 days during the preseason, after uh, which I like to do everything on the course. So for example, if we talk about uh, a full month of preseason, like four weeks, maybe 10 days, uh, I would uh, go with players outside to do maybe two or three uh, running sessions with different goals. Uh, and then, next 10 days uh, we would uh, do some kind of specific conditioning together with basketball training sessions and then last 10 days of that preseason I would leave completely to uh, competitive conditioning uh, and live play of uh, games such as 4-on-4, four 5-on-5 four, five five and, and so on. This is general idea about preseason conditioning but of course uh, we try to individualize uh, conditioning, especially if we talk about basic conditioning. When it comes to specific conditioning, we can make certain indiv like individual adjustments. And then when it comes to uh, a pure competitive conditioning, usually we have more or less all of the players included uh, because the, the goal of competitive conditioning is not only competitive conditioning, it's also learning uh, new sets of uh, uh, that we play, uh, so tactical part is really important and then in that case even though we might think that one player is uh, uh, very well conditioned, he, he might do an extra work in order to uh, improve his uh, tactical uh, skills together with the team. Uh, starting point from me when we start the preseason just to see a uh, general level of uh, conditioning is at least one test and usually in the last three four years i'm using 3015 intermittent fitness test that helps me uh, differentiate players who are it's a little bit different to say is it like aerobic capacity because in the last um, uh, minute of the test you will definitely use a lot of your anaerobic uh, power uh, to finish the test and you cannot say that it's purely aerobic test but in general you, we can uh, say that uh, that this test can uh, distinguish or differentiate uh, players who are um, in, in basic conditioning at a good level or uh, uh, below uh, something that, that should be considered good for elite basketball players. So for example we run the test in the first days of preseason and I always uh, like to set the threshold at 19 at 13 15 intermittent fitness test uh, where uh, players who, who can reach 19 
uh, level 19 can stop and that means that uh, they have uh, basic capacities uh, pretty good and then on the other hand if you have players who are running 17 to 18 uh, I have never witnessed that someone uh, ran 16 if they ran, uh, run 17 18 they might have uh, different conditioning protocols especially if we go for basic conditioning uh, maybe with some coaches uh, we will uh, only push uh, players who uh, couldn't reach level 19 in the first 10 days to do some extra conditioning while the other guys who have uh, good uh, basic levels of conditioning might do only shooting in the last part of the practice while I while I will go with one group uh, outside and routes run outside uh, different uh, intervals such as long intervals of uh, three four minutes or some short intervals depending on the on the goal of that day. Short rest guys and we are coming back soon. Hello boys and girls and welcome back to this episode of uh, one-on-one interviews. Today I'm alone uh, in the quarantine, uh, completely weird to talk with the camera but it is what it is. Let's just take advantage of being at home. Next question uh, was asked by my friend Marin Dadic. Luka, when you were in Croatia, you worked with uh, athletes from different sports and different type of athletes. So can you tell me the differences between strength training program and strength training protocols, of course, in sports like tennis, basketball and football? Thank you, Marin. For me, uh, it's pretty simple. I, I was uh, highly influenced uh, early in my career by Mike Boyle's work and especially his uh, strength training approach and strength training philosophy. Uh, so for me, the difference between team sport athletes and their strength program and athletes in racket sports, it's not so different. Uh, we want to build good strength foundation with good submaximal and maximal strength. Uh, with uh, uh, we can also uh, use uh, basic lifts to develop uh, hypertrophy and muscle mass needed for that athlete and that sport and then with that uh, foundations of uh, basic strength we can move into rate of force development and explosive work uh, and plyometrics uh, so I think uh, in general when we come when it comes to uh, weightlifting uh, I think it's uh, all about basic lifts with free weights back squats strap bar deadlift uh, single leg squat uh, split squats uh, split squats with uh, rear foot elevated and so on and upper body movements uh, with pull and push uh, philosophy so a lot of uh, bent over rows pull-ups uh, one arm bench press uh, bench press for uh, with, dumb, dumb, uh, with uh, barbells, uh, push-ups and variations of push-ups and, and so on. Uh, I also think that uh, before we talk about the elite players and development of uh, sub-max and max strength, also uh, relative strength development is uh, very, very important. Uh, and here uh, in, in the section or the field of relative strength development uh, I have found uh, the greatest information uh, from Pavel Tsatsoulin uh, and his book Naked Warrior. Uh, I think once we build good strength foundation uh, and, and general basic athleticism with our players uh, we can move into analysis of demands of that certain sport. So uh, this is the first step when we are looking uh, into differences between basketball, soccer and, and tennis. And for example, we can, uh, from the analysis of soccer game, we can say that out of these three sports, uh, soccer players uh, are the ones that use the least uh, parallel fit position. They might do it uh, in certain jumps uh, but it's it happens uh, very very rarely during uh, the game uh, 
on the other hand basketball players tennis players use parallel feet position much more so this is one of the ways how to uh, uh, prepare and select exercises when it comes to uh, strength work uh, when it comes to tennis compared to uh, basketball and uh, soccer we have uh, much more rotational movements in tennis especially rotational movements that demand power and uh, strength especially power so developing strength and power in rotational uh, movements is of utmost importance for uh, for tennis players and then when we compare for example another movement pattern that uh, we will try to use also in the lifting room uh, and with that movement improve players performance on the court is definitely lateral movements that are uh, we could say the key for tennis players and and basketball players so uh, doing a lot of uh, lateral uh, movements uh, lateral bounds uh, shuffles cross steps uh, is something that we have to integrate into uh, strength and power development when it comes to tennis players and and basketball players and then last but not least i'm just like following the general idea from uh, approaching strength in general then approaching uh, strength for different sport and finally uh, something that is probably the most important thing but uh, now in this explanation comes at the, at the last uh, position is individual needs uh, we have to know who we are working with uh, if we are working with uh, uh, a tennis player who likes to run a lot, uh, who likes to keep the ball inside, uh, inside and, and just uh, try to um, stress his conditioning qualities, so he might run and move the opponent a lot and he would move a lot on the court, so probably he would not be a very muscled uh, the tennis player so we have to respect a little bit how we design strength program for that player uh, not to make him super bulky and and uh, of course in that case we will also take care of nutrition uh, we also have to know if we are working with players who have a lot of experience or not so much experience in the weightlifting room so definitely training age is something that we have to consider uh, previous experience and desires of uh, that player are also important uh, i think uh, players who have great experience from uh, uh, previous teams and previous uh, strength and conditioning coaches uh, is definitely something that we have to respect uh, from my uh, personal experience especially here in basconia where i'm working with the elite players uh, i'm very very lucky that most of our players every season come from uh, great programs from MBA, from uh, American universities and uh, I think uh, that is something very very important when it comes to really designing uh, individual uh, programs. Uh, also considering uh, players previous injuries it is something that can change a little bit or modify uh, strength program for example players who had low back issues or are prone to have tight uh, muscles in the back uh, they might uh, not do often or they might not do at all uh, exercises such as trap bar deadlift or back squats we would move more towards split squats or uh, single leg uh, work uh, also uh, even though i like complex training where we would do some submax uh, lifts and then we would do maybe some explosive movements even some plyometric movements I have to also think about uh, players current load especially during the in-season program if a player uh, plays a lot of minutes uh, during the games and he also participates in all training uh, sessions with the team uh, it is not probably it is not the smartest thing to push him uh, to do a lot of uh, plyometric jumps however uh, we we can have players who play a lot of minutes who train with the team and then they they will still ask you to do a lot of uh, plyometric stuff in order to keep them uh, at the highest 
physical performance. So uh, when it comes to individual needs, there is so many different factors that we have to respect, that we have to consider uh, when we are making programs. And that's why uh, I love my job so much because uh, on a, even though I have a certain idea of strength program that tomorrow might be the best for my uh, for each player of uh, my team uh, maybe tomorrow uh, i will have to make certain adjustments uh, because uh, there will uh, be players who will come a little bit sore a little bit more fatigue uh, with certain uh, problem in their knee or their back or physios will come to me and say hey luca please today avoid these uh, exercises uh, with this player just not not to uh, push uh, for example uh, his low back or, or his knees uh, because he was complaining and, and the treatment uh, was not so, so successful and so on. So this is definitely something uh, to consider when it comes to uh, differences between strength training for soccer players, football players and tennis players. Another question about pre-game lifts from Reggie. Hey Luca, my other question is what's your opinion about pre-game lift in the morning of the game or right before the game? Oh, I love, I love this question because uh, I'm a huge fan of pre-game lifts, both as Reggie said on the game day or one day before the game. I honestly believe that uh, uh, short, quick, uh, effective uh, pre-game lift can really improve uh, physical performance and it's something that is supported by uh, science and also I think it is very beneficial from a mentality point of view I think uh, through uh, this uh, muscular activation and general arousal I think uh, players uh, feel more comfortable and I think more ready to play uh, the game uh, I think uh, when it comes to really making the program of pre-game lifts, there is not such a big difference when it comes to uh, exercise selection. Uh, it's more about adjusting uh, loads of certain exercise and especially volume. Now, our pre-game lifts and the lifts on the game day might not be so different from other lifting sessions because uh, I'm huge believer uh, that uh, in-season training program should be microdosed uh, training sessions that last 20 to 30 minutes maybe 40 minutes uh, with some uh, uh, preventive circuit uh, at the beginning or, or something similar maybe individual routine but 20 to 30 minutes is more than enough and then use basically every training game uh, to, to spend some time in the weightlifting room and I think this pre-game lift can be, for example, 20 minutes long. Uh, I think the key thing is to uh, load players with the load that uh, usually they uh, would like to do before the game. So I think feedback from players is really important. So from my uh, point of view, I think it's good to do uh, explosive work. Uh, and most of the players uh, usually feel comfortable with the explosive lifts uh, maybe 30 to 70 percent of their uh, uh, max uh, repetition but uh, we also have players who like to do uh, two three uh, repetitions of sub-maximal uh, lifts and this is something that uh, I'm not afraid of uh, because I think the most important thing doesn't matter if you choose three repetition max or uh, I don't know uh, six uh, repetitions at 50% of your RM uh, is not the problem the problem is if you don't rest enough and then uh, suddenly this work uh, that is uh, that should be used as a primer as the as the there's a training to uh, make your nervous system uh, ready uh, you make you, you you shift it towards more metabolic work and, and then it becomes, becomes more demanding and then uh, it can have a counter effect where players can come the next day 
uh, even fatigued. So I think the key, com the key element when it comes to pre-game lifts, doesn't matter if it's on the game day or game day minus one, is having a uh, good rest in between the sets. So we can keep maybe repetitions three to eight, depending on the load that we use. If we use 30 to 90% of, of RM, maybe three to eight would be a good uh, rep range for certain sets. Then we will do maybe uh, three to five sets per exercise. And maybe for lower body, we will not do more than two different exercises. So the only thing that we have to respect is a long rest between those uh, exercises, which is usually two to three minutes at least. So for example, uh, one training session that can uh, be a primer uh, would be uh, three sets of tre bar deadlift uh, at uh, 80, 85 and 90 percent of uh, one RM, uh, three sets of three repetitions uh, with good rest in between, three minutes for example in between. After that you take a little bit longer rest, three to five minutes and then you have three sets of uh, clean or a snatch uh, with 30 or 40 kilos on the bar uh, and then we can maybe add to it three sets of five drop jumps. Uh, this could be more than enough uh, that players feel uh, very activated and usually for that kind of work we will need at least 20 to 30 minutes because of the longer uh, rest periods. Now, another question about force velocity profiling made by Alex. What's your opinion about um, force velocity profiling, um, kind of a, uh, also dynamic strength index or any other that we may use to understand strength deficits? Um, what's your opinion about them? Are you using them? How you use them? Excellent. Uh, I'm a huge believer in uh, velocity-based uh, training and even though I don't use it on a daily basis with my team because of the organizational problems, for example, I don't have so many accelerometers, I don't have so many iPad, uh, iPads uh, available and so on, uh, I try to push my players that every lift, lift doesn't matter what they do, they always have to do it as explosive as possible, as fast as possible. And this is something that probably they hear uh, the most times in the, in the gym, because uh, I always say like the, the concentric phase of movement should always be as explosive as possible. And I always uh, try to uh, explain them that this is something that they are always looking to have on the court. So that is something that we have to also have it have in the gym. Now, uh, for me, basic strength uh, and, and optimal levels of uh, basic strength is, uh, is the foundation. And without good foundation, I don't go into force velocity profiling of, of my players. I will always wait that players have at least, for example, 1.5 of their body weight uh, lifted uh, three times uh, in deadlift. Uh, I will wait that they feel comfortable doing split squats with two kettlebells of 32 or two kettlebells of 40 kilos, and that they do at least a single leg squat with two kettlebells of uh, 24 kilos. Of course, they also have to perform uh, a little bit deeper single leg squat uh, with their own uh, body weight with good knee uh, control. Then uh, when once we have, for example, lower body or even upper body, uh, for example, in bench press to have at least three repetitions uh, in their own body weight or to do at least uh, five to 10 uh, pull-ups. For me, this, this is a starting point where I can say that uh, levels of basic strength are enough so we can start with uh, force velocity profiling. And then what I would do based on, on velocity, uh, I would just try to uh, 
uh, load players with different uh, weights. Um, maybe for a trap bar deadlift it would be 30%, uh, 60% uh, and 90% uh, or 30, 50, 70 and 90% of uh, 1RM and with um, uh, velocity of the bar I would see if they have certain uh, deficiencies when it comes uh, to movement velocity and then may maybe in the training program we would attack it and we would uh, work on it. Uh, from uh, force velocity or velocity based training I also like to stress just the uh, uh, velocity of the bar uh, so a lot of uh, uh, speed strength work uh, we would uh, do by measuring only pure velocity uh, to have uh, at least one meter per second or more uh, in with certain weights and what I uh, really like about having a, a clear uh, picture or clear value of uh, movement velocity or power output uh, is actually the fact that we can work on uh, power endurance and we can work on so we can work on the on many repetitions by maintaining the the power output or the velocity that uh, we would like to and then once we see that that velocity of the bar is dropping we can just uh, uh, put the weights down and rest until the next set this is also something that is really important because it's effort-based uh, programming rather than uh, one uh, repetition and, and percentage of one repetition uh, so I think it's it's uh, another quality that we can bring to general program of our strength uh, uh, sessions and uh, last but not least I think when it comes to force velocity profiling uh, and uh, velocity based training uh, is the fact that players can really see the, the number in front of them themselves and I think it's uh, very good from a motivational po uh, uh, point of view and also it is uh, good because all of our players are uh, competitive and just by competing and against that number we can uh, highly influence the quality of work that players are actually uh, doing in the gym and uh, quality of effort that uh, they are giving to uh, do certain reps and certain sets of uh, different exercises. Costas. Hi Luca, hope you're doing well considering the circumstances. Uh, I know you've been doing uh, quite a lot of work uh, regarding uh, load monitoring and I just want to know how how this information that you gather throughout the season uh, helps you make practical decisions regarding uh, practice intensity, practice frequency, regarding player rest, and in general, how do you use the, all this data in a practical way? Thanks. Mm. First of all, I have to say what I'm using, so later on I can explain a little bit uh, how I'm using different data. Uh, currently, with Basconia, I'm using Catapult, uh, so it's uh, external objective data that uh, we collect through uh, our practices. I also try to ask our players for the RPE so I can get the SRP values. Uh, when it comes to objective parameters of players readiness, uh, we use uh, blood analysis uh, every two months with our medical department and then uh, I also like to perform uh, different uh, questionnaires or use different questionnaires on, uh, on a weekly or a daily basis so for example a wellness questionnaire would be used on the first day or uh, first training day of the week which might be Monday or Tuesday depends if we have Monday off and then we can use also total quality of recovery questionnaire on the game day so if we use it on every game day uh, we might collect data two or three times per week here in in Europe uh, I also try to uh, compare data between external and internal loads so I might compare player load to SRP and uh, those are some uh, valuable uh, variables that that can be used in order to to track uh, loads uh, so subjective and objective uh, data 
are equally important to me because uh, I always try to uh, remind myself that even though uh, we are in in the uh, e era where uh, we have a lot of technology available and uh, there is a lot of numbers, especially technologies like Catapult where you can create your own variables and you can uh, after one training session you can get millions of parameters. I think we should uh, never forget that we are working with humans and uh, by working with humans uh, it's always important to consider their subjective uh, feedback and also our subject subjective feedback uh, as experts in the field who observe daily practices of, of our athletes. So I think considering my subjective opinion together with subjective opinion of the player supported by objective data from uh, different technologies such as heart rate or micro technology and so on uh, is something that we uh, we should definitely uh, keep in our mind uh, of course uh, i was using uh, in the past different things such as uh, aura rings uh, for tracking player's sleep quality and uh, gadgets like that or omega wave and so on is something that can be really really useful uh, from time to time we might even run some uh, jumping or sprint uh, tests to see players readiness even though uh, we are always careful when to do it and 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 how to perform it because of the just congested uh, schedule uh, in the competition uh, now when I have all of this uh, data in, in front of myself uh, there is uh, something that I can uh, use right away without consulting the head coach because I have different responsibilities. Uh, so when it comes for example to uh, recovery of players uh, or some kind of strength session uh, by having all of this data in front of me I might change some things or I might add some things. So for example in the strength session if player is feeling sore I might change a little bit lower body uh, workout because he has tight hamstrings and I will focus more on the upper body. When it comes to uh, sleeping bad, I can uh, immediately talk to our uh, doctor or to our physios and maybe uh, help our player uh, to sleep better, maybe give some advices uh, or give even some melatonin pills or whatever uh, uh, could be could be useful on the other hand for certain things uh, to to manage and to change I need to have support of of my head coach and here is the the trickiest part with some head coaches uh, based on all of the data that you have you will sit down and plan the whole week or plan the next day at least sorry and with some coaches it will be just like okay uh, provide me some data after practice just so I can see how players practiced and at the at the end of the week just show me a little bit uh, how we are on the acute chronic uh, workload ratio and for everything else I'm gonna be in charge I'm gonna make the complete schedule of today's session and the weekly uh, weekly training sessions so uh, I'm I'm trying to give to coach uh, not as much uh, data as possible. I'm trying to be selective. So for example, currently with our head coach Dusko Ivanovic, after every practice, uh, we, uh, I present him uh, data on player load, uh, individual player load and individual uh, high intensity changes of direction. So he has two parameters. Uh, one is uh, related to volume player load and one is related to intensity number of high intensity changes of direction of course he's following training time something that uh, he always keeps in mind and these are the variables that he usually uses in order to to talk about uh, training sessions how we did it and uh, in order to plan uh, sessions for the for the uh, uh, following days so uh, it really depends on the coach what kind of variables variables uh, we will use for example in the in the training facility where we have antennas we might change and uh, we will not use player load but we will use distance as a parameter of training volume so uh, some things can change I think the most important thing is to have one or two uh, variables variables that you use uh, 
in order to talk about training volume. So it can be training time, it can be player load uh, and so on, or uh, uh, some heart rate based parameters. And on the other hand, you can have intensity uh, parameters. So you might have player load per minute or you will have high intensity changes of direction. Or for example, in the in case of heart rate monitoring, you might have time spent in the highest intensity uh, heart rate zone. So uh, I think always combination of subjective and objective uh, parameter is, uh, parameters is, is the best uh, because it gives a clear picture and comprehensive picture about uh, uh, our uh, players and about their uh, current uh, physical condition. As an expert in load management, uh, what do you think um, is the future of that field going to be? Which aspects you think are going to be more relevant uh, during the next years? Thanks, Alejandro. Well, I think uh, that load monitoring and management field is still growing. And I think in the future we have to learn much more from games, uh, especially in Europe, because data from official games uh, is still not there. Many federation uh, still uh, forbid use of micro technology during official games. So I think once we will collect a lot of data from official games, we will be uh, more efficient uh, and more effective in our daily work in team practices. I think also an important part of future will be uh, support of the head coaches uh, for individualization in uh, load monitoring and load management, uh, something that is uh, currently happening in, in the NBA, but in Europe it is still not uh, so stressed uh, as an important part of uh, weekly and daily uh, work with our athletes and our teams. So I think uh, changing a little bit uh, training philosophy uh, for older coaches and uh, support from younger head coaches in, in Europe will definitely play an important role. And just acknowledging uh, the importance of uh, load monitoring and management will be a huge step uh, forward. Uh, I think uh, we will have uh, different gadgets and more technologies involved in the general load monitoring and management. Uh, I think more and more teams will be able to use different uh, sleep tracking devices, uh, some uh, quick uh, tools to assess um, mental and physical readiness. Uh, so uh, th that is definitely a, a future. But I think the most important thing that we have to consider when it comes to future of load monitoring is that, uh, as I said previously, we are working with human beings and, and that's something that will never change uh, in sports. So it doesn't matter how much technologies go forward, I think uh, we should always uh, keep in mind that uh, subjective feedback from players and subjective uh, opinion of us as experts and, and subjective opinion of the head coach and supporting staff will be uh, of great value. I think um, we also need to improve, improve more the level of communication between coaching staff uh, and uh, this is something that is also future of load management so uh, assistant coaches and the head coach can understand uh, even better the idea behind uh, load monitoring and management and uh, individualization uh, once we will learn more from games we will be uh, able to be more effective and more efficient in uh, prescribing loads for team training sessions and also by knowing uh, better and respecting better uh, individual uh, physical readiness, we will uh, also be able to make certain adjustments. I think a lot of players, uh, a lot of head coaches in Europe 
in general are, are a little bit afraid of this individualization mentality because they, they think that ah, players will be too protected, you know, we are protecting players, they are not practicing enough and so on. I don't uh, think that's that's bad way to, to look at it, uh, but usually it comes from coaches who don't uh, speak about the importance of load monitoring and management and they don't stress it in their philosophy as a part of their uh, program. And then when it comes to uh, the needs of, uh, I don't know, keeping one player uh, apart from one part of the practice uh, seems a little bit awkward, uh, players don't have trust, then players start looking at each other why today this player and, and they have some doubts. But I think if the communication uh, from the beginning will be uh, clear and if coach will stay that as an important part of team success, then we will not have any problems and in the key moments of the week which could be one or two moments we can spare some players from uh, some minutes in team practices and uh, let them recover well and prepare uh, for the for the upcoming game upcoming game i think if we support players in that way they will be both uh, physically and mentally uh, ready for uh, the upcoming competitions And now we will make a short break and we are coming for the last part of this interview. Hello, welcome back to the last part of the interview and we will start with one interesting question from Staska. Probably you have been coaching for a decade or even more. So I'm wondering what kind of failures or maybe what is the biggest failure that you think you have ever had? Thanks, Staska. I think we should always acknowledge our failures. And uh, the most important thing after the failure is that uh, you appreciate it, uh, you learn from it, and you give your best not to repeat it. Uh, I can give you two examples uh, that I consider maybe two of my failures during uh, the period with Vasconia. In the first year, I had one player who was just uh, coming back uh, after the injury and we were doing probably the last session before joining the team again. It was some specific conditioning on the court and he was just goofing off, he was just acting lazy uh, and at one point we were about to start uh, the, the, the last uh, interval of work and then he, he told me, hey, can I go to the bathroom? And I just snapped. I was I was really pissed because uh, he was kind of tr trying to take advantage of uh, my my character, my my patience, and that is something that uh, I I found it offensive, even though I I, I shouldn't have because uh, I think uh, his laziness was talking more about himself than me and. In, in the case when I work, like I learned that in case I work with lazy players, e either I'm going to be a, a very strict coach who's gonna shout and yell and, and do something about it, even though I'm, I'm not doing that because after that situation, I have never experienced that again and I didn't have to shout at any, anyone or I could go in, in different direction and just uh, try to forget it and then focus on the next training session and be supportive for that player and in in most of the cases if uh, I continue to support that player even though he had like a bad moment uh, everything turned out pretty well and it was it was uh, good so I think uh, getting pissed because at certain moments someone is uh, being a little bit lazy is definitely not a good uh, reason to get pissed at that uh, player when it comes to a second uh, example, it was more like a, a team uh, situation. We played second year, we played uh, second game of finals against uh, Real Madrid in Madrid. We won the first game, so we were uh, one up uh, in the series. And then second game, they played really well. Uh, the third quarter, they scored like so many points and, and, and then we were down by like 15. And uh, 
due to my happiness about the score from the previous game, I I stood up and I shouted at players that uh, uh, we should play tougher and we should fight more. Uh, what I think, uh, and, but I said it like in in a little bit uh, critical way, in a, in a, in a really bad way, uh, and no one actually reacted to that to that moment uh, because we were already 15 points down. Players didn't feel like uh, very competitive. But what happened in the locker room after the game? I stayed with players, and they were talking about uh, the game. They were talking about how we have to. Uh, play smart now when we go home for the next game and then at the end of that uh, conversation captain turned to me and he said like uh, Luca I don't want to hear any more from you bad words during the game or uh, spreading some kind of negative thoughts and I was kind of shocked at first I didn't say one thing and later on I had first discussion and then uh, a conversation with our captain and then I, I realized uh, that I made a mistake that uh, I should that doesn't matter which situation being up 15 points or down 15 points I should always be supportive to our players and uh, I think uh, whenever we play basketball or doesn't matter if it's a game or training uh, me as a strength coach I should never uh, give any uh, negative thoughts uh, also in general I'm trying to avoid uh, a uh, negative uh, criticism uh, so after that point I learned that uh, I should always uh, stay positive and better say nothing than uh, a negative uh, critique next question Kostas So my third question has to do with rejection. How do you handle a rejection either by the coach or a player? And by that I mean that, you know, sometimes we go to our coaches with ideas, with opinions, with suggestions, and they just don't accept them for their own reasons. But we still need to convey that information because we think that that is going to help the team or protect a player from injury. And, and uh, just generally we want them to get our take on, of th on things. And how do you handle that rejection? How do you go back to the coach or how do you uh, go about that? And, or the same thing can happen with a player. We can suggest something, an exercise, a method, or, or a, a way to approach a certain situation, and they won't listen. And that can be also stressful for, for, for our job. So how do you handle all that? Uh, it's, it's a really good question because uh, I think it's the problem of ego. If, if we set our ego pretty high, uh, then we will always have problem in the communication uh, with head coaches and players. The environment of team sports is always changing. We always have to adapt to it. And if if we cannot accept changes, and if we are really stubborn about our ideas, uh, usually we will have a lot of problems. Uh, with the head coaches, uh, I when when they say something uh, against my idea or they. Uh, tell me to change something that I have started to do like for example uh, a warm-up that has to be a little bit uh, quicker or a strength session that cannot be uh, 35 minutes but 25 minutes or something like that I always try to remind myself that uh, we are still supporting stuff uh, so I'm the one who needs to adjust and I'm the one who needs to accept uh, that I am uh, working with the head coach uh, not for the head coach but with the head coach but respecting that he is the guy who takes the, the the final responsibility and who is making the final call so in in that case i'm trying to uh, completely respect the head coach and if head coach in certain certain situations doesn't uh, ask me for a, an opinion or uh, says that something that i have planned needs to be changed uh, I'm trying to find it uh, not offensive uh, because it's his idea why uh, we need to change something and maybe behind that change uh, is something completely positive and something that can really help the team so I'm not trying to take things personally because 
probably the intention of the head coach is not to uh, make changes because he has something against me personally. And there are always coaches who will use us as a strength and conditioning coach uh, as a great support and there will be coaches who will use us uh, just for strength sessions, some recovery and some uh, pre-training warm-up and preparation. Uh, on the other hand, we will have head coaches uh, who will invite us every day two or three times sorry, to their office and we might talk about every little detail uh, or, or about training or, or a certain game. So I think if we keep our ego very low and we uh, try to understand that uh, changes that uh, coaches want to make are not based on, on personal problem or personal issue uh, is definitely something uh, that can uh, change your body language, uh, how you react to that change. Uh, and this is something that it's uh, very, very important for many coaches because if you uh, say with words something that your body language doesn't follow, head coach will go with your body language and this is the moment where you can uh, break or lose a part of the trust between uh, you and the head coach. When it comes to players, it's just a little bit different. Uh, I'm always ready to uh, moments where players will come uh, pissed uh, to work. Uh, usually they come with me first, either if it's a strength session or if it's, uh, if it's a warm-up. And some players will not be motivated uh, right from the first second oh, when I see them. There might be some financial issues, there, there might be some family issues. Uh, there, there, there might be uh, some problem with a lack of sleep due to a newly born child. So uh, before I make any assumptions, uh, I always try to uh, ask players uh, why they're uh, rejecting my ideas or why they're uh, uh, trying to avoid something that I wrote on the board and so on. Uh, the only thing that I'm trying to avoid when it comes uh, to this uh, certain situations when players might say, ah, I'm not doing uh, strength today, uh, I might not react uh, immediately uh, to that situation, but I will wait a, a minute when that player is alone in the corner or uh, whatever, and I will just uh, ask kindly, hey, uh, is there any problem? Uh, can I help you somehow? Do you want uh, me to change a little bit the program? And this is something that I would do once, maybe I would do twice, uh, not in a short period of time, but I would do twice. But if I, can, if I see that player is taking advantage of it, I would talk with him individually after practice. But honestly, I have never experienced that players are taking advantage of my kind approach. Uh, so it's something that uh, uh, I can only imagine. But it would be definitely if I see that players are taking advantage of uh, some some of my uh, ideas and uh, taking advantage of my approach, uh, I will definitely sit with them and, and try to, to talk and explain that they're uh, working for themselves, not for me, and that I'm just a guy who can help with my knowledge and with my uh, support. So if they want to take advantage of it, that's good for them. If they don't want to do it, then... Uh, we have we have problem for him not for me another question great one from marin we studied together 10 years ago so now i can see the tears in your eyes time flies my friend believe, believe me we spent a lot of time together, talking, had a training together, learning. And can you tell me your advices for the young student? How to become a new Lucas Villar? PhD, of course. Well, thank you, Marin. But uh, I, I really uh, believe that uh, no one should be uh, next Lucas Villar. Uh, but uh, if you consider that uh, being in Basconia 
at my age uh, is something uh, what makes me successful. I can share with you a couple of ideas what I believe is uh, important to, to uh, arrive here uh, at the age of 30, uh, 35. Uh, I think f first thing that uh, I believe uh, helped me to arrive here is that uh, is the fact that during my studies in Zagreb I realized what uh, I want to specialize strength and conditioning of athletes so uh, I chose my craft and this is something that uh, I have never doubted uh, after that uh, moment I put away all of the things uh, that I was doing before such as uh, basketball officiating and stuff like that just to earn some extra money I left everything on the side and I started to focus first day when I started to work my uh, when I started to do my internship in basketball club Zagreb with junior team I said this is going to be my major focus and from there on I'm just gonna uh, focus on on being as as good as I can then the second thing I believe that it's really important is to do every day something that will uh, improve uh, your craft. So it can be uh, reading books, it can be reading articles, it can be watching videos, webinars, seminars, whatever, you name it. It can be listening to podcasts. Just try to find a source of information uh, that can be useful to, to master your craft and it, it should not always be related to uh, strength and conditioning. Maybe you saw these books. These are the, uh, the last 20 books, more or less, that I have read. And maybe one or two books are related actually to strength and conditioning. Maybe those for strength and conditioning are here behind. But uh, most of the books uh, that I have read lately are related to communication, self-improvement, you know, sports psychology and so on. So just trying to uh, view our field very holistically is something that can uh, Im improve uh, the overall quality of the work. Of course, in the first uh, years of my uh, career, I was focusing much more on real strength and conditioning knowledge rather than uh, uh, communication skills, self-improvement and so on. But uh, as years pass by, uh, I changed a little bit the ratio. However, however, I still enjoy a lot uh, strength and conditioning uh, books and, and material. Uh, then I think uh, if you also want to be successful, you have to find yourself a mentor. Uh, it's maybe it's not the key that you have to have a clear mentor uh, but I think to have an experienced uh, experienced coach behind you who will uh, uh, support you who will uh, uh, give you uh, good advices and who will uh, help you uh, I think this is the most important thing when it comes to mentors who is going to help you be uh, selective and who is going to help you uh, in, in making decisions which books to read which uh, books uh, not to avoid but maybe re uh, read later in, in your life or uh, the guy who is going to uh, explain you certain things and uh, uh, explain you how to build foundations in your work uh, is something uh, very very uh, important uh, if you don't have a mentor, you don't believe uh, in, in the role of mentor, I think you, you should at least find yourself or uh, surround yourself with one or two uh, young strength and conditioning coaches, uh, such as I had uh, Marin, uh, who I would talk with every single day about certain uh, topic. Uh, we, would, we, we were both so passionate and even today we call each other and we talk about uh, things that we read or uh, things that we watch so I think it's it's very important to have a person uh, who will uh, resonate with you and be on the same level when it comes uh, to passion for a strength and conditioning field and someone who uh, will be there to debate things to discuss things and very often with Marin 
I would have a, a conversation and what would happen uh, is we would sit, we would talk and uh, maybe we would not say something uh, very smart but uh, then when you go home and you're alone uh, in your room just before you go to sleep and then you have this uh, conversation uh, from three hours ago in your mind maybe at that moment uh, some ideas for future work will will uh, uh, come out and and then you will feel help, happy and have these uh, positive vibes in you and even more motivated uh, to, to, to work. So uh, at least to ha have a, a partner uh, or a colleague who will, uh, who will uh, be on the same track uh, as you are. Then I think uh, young students, uh, as Marin asked about students, young students should know that for me, four more most important things uh, to uh, take from uh, studying uh, uh, at the faculty uh, should be, first of all, take some uh, basic knowledge, okay, you will get some basic knowledge, but it's far away from what you should have uh, in your life. Uh, you have to pass the exams and get diploma, so it's the it's the second thing that you, you should do when you're studying and you should focus on. Third thing is to have a lot of fun because that's the best probably period uh, of your life where, uh, as I spoke with Marin, we lived uh, without money and it was uh, the best moments of, of our lives. We had the, the greatest fun uh, and we will never party like that uh, in, in our lives again so uh, at least I think so uh, because that was that was uh, in some moments too much and and then I think that the fourth thing that you have to take from from faculty and that's probably the most valuable thing uh, behind diploma that might uh, be crucial for for your job in the future is uh, connections and friendships uh, especially if you can connect with uh, people who uh, will be in your field, involved in your, in, in your field, is something uh, of the highest uh, value without any doubt. Uh, I have a uh, great relationship with a couple of my friends, some of them strength and conditioning coaches, some of them are working in also in, in team sports uh, with video analysis or uh, similar type of jobs. And I think these four values are the greatest or four things that you have to focus on when you're uh, studying and uh, you have to realize that the knowledge that you take from the university is just a starting point and then you have to start really digging deeper into the knowledge of, of our field. Uh, I think also if, if you want to be successful you have to surround yourself with successful people. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, I have always done consciously and subconsciously uh, you know when you come to team environment and you see a negative guy who doesn't read anything who is just like uh, doing his work I'm not gonna say uh, is it nutritionist physio or strength coach but after two or three months I can see that maybe not consciously but subconsciously I surrounded myself with with positive group of people that I'm uh, most of the time uh, spending having coffees conversations with people who are positive and willing to learn uh, uh, something every day uh, willing to improve and uh, uh, listening to your ideas and and you enjoy listening to their opinions so this is something uh, that is really uh, important in your life uh, i also think that we should as strength and conditioning coaches we should be very disciplined uh, we should focus on our goals uh, we should follow our daily routines uh, even though uh, you might not feel like reading or watching something every day uh, in the end you know when you read a certain article that you will feel better and i think this discipline is crucial uh, for for a long-term success and I think when it comes to uh, age of 25, 30 and so on, I think it's really important to find yourself a, a life partner, uh, a girlfriend, a fiance or, or a wife 
who will completely support you, uh, who will understand uh, your desire to be better every day and who will support you in the moments when you get a call and you say and someone asks you if if you are accepting the job in in the foreign country and this is something that uh, i really appreciate appreciate with my fiance because uh, uh, i think my life here in spain would be completely different and as i said at the beginning of this interview i am a family guy and i'm a family oriented guy so i think building my uh, professional career is uh, as important as building a good family and uh, therefore uh, it is really really important to have uh, both sides uh, equally controlled and to have a partner who will support you in your uh, daily work now I have a question from Costas when I'm in doubt, I always ask myself two questions. Who can I ask and what can I read? Um, I just want to know who are your three top go-to books when you have a question or, and uh, which are the top three people in the industry that you always refer to when you, have, uh, when you come across something that you're not clear or you don't know. No, that's, a, that's a great question. About the books, I cannot name one book because uh, a very comprehensive book uh, that I can use as my uh, daily uh, point of reference, it just doesn't exist. Usually my knowledge comes from different books, you know, for strength I have this author, for conditioning I have this author, for uh, rehab I have this author, for testing I have that author and th that's the main reason why I cannot uh, say uh, the name of, of one book and especially here I'm limited these all books that you can see uh, and more books I have here at home uh, are the books that I have ordered and probably one day I will have to bring all of them back to Croatia but my majority like 80-90% of my books that I uh, own uh, strength and conditioning books uh, are at home in Croatia so uh, I would lie if I would say that I have a book that I use on a daily basis uh, because in the last three four years uh, I only have books that I have uh, ordered uh, ordered here uh, but uh, when it comes to people uh, from the field uh, that I use as my point of reference Costas who has, who has the question uh, is definitely one of the guys I think he's one of the most experienced guys in in Europe and one of the best uh, strength conditioning uh, coaches uh, one of the guys who has the best experience in Euroleague uh, before the format was changed and also uh, uh, in this new format of Euroleague so Kostas is definitely on my list uh, when I need to uh, uh, need to know certain things especially when it comes to uh, management of teams communication with the coach uh, every person who I call uh, has uh, different qualities or uh, different different knowledge that I would that I would uh, look for uh, for example with this uh, interviews and some projects that uh, younger people might be interested in I might call uh, Staska uh, Marin is a great support uh, since I have started uh, my work so basically with him I go uh, through every little problem maybe he's the guy who, who I would also talk about some super private stuff regarding uh, finances in the business investments uh, so uh, it can be the different uh, different people I might call uh, Reggie to discuss uh, recovery I might call uh, Sasha from Serbia about uh, strength training or some uh, rehab prehab or to get some different opinion because he works with uh, uh, soccer players uh, so there, there are different different uh, people when it comes to load monitoring management I would uh, ask Julen Castellano uh, who was my mentor at PhD and who is sports scientist here in Basconia when it comes to statistical analysis and Excel uh, and handling Excel I would uh, call Ugo who is strength and conditioning coach in Basconia so there is different people uh, based on their um, highest skills and, and, and qualities related to the field however all of them are uh, amazing people 
uh, on the private level. Next question, Staska. I know that you are, okay. <laughs> I have to look at the camera. So I know that you are a very functional uh, guy and you have PhD and you wrote two books. So I'm wondering what is the hardest chest workout that you have ever done? Okay, hardest uh, chest workout. I think the, the hardest chest workout was the one uh, I cannot recall like the, the exact uh, workout and exercises, but I think the worst chest workouts are those where you go all metabolic, short rest, like 30 seconds to one minute max, but 30 seconds between exercises. And then you either do some like German volume uh, with simple exercise and you do like 10, 15 sets uh, or, or even more. And the second option would be maybe metabolic, like you make some kind of nice, not like super set, but mega set where you would go through like five, six different exercises with very very uh, short uh, uh, rest in between so for example you would go uh, bench press then you would move to dips and then you would move to uh, dumbbell flies and then you would go to close grip uh, bench press and then you would go for push-up with bands and then you would finish with uh, some uh, plate squeezes and something like that so like when set lasts for two three minutes uh, and you have short amount of uh, rest in between exercises that is probably uh, the type of workout that kills me the most and the last question by thomas i'm a big uh, quote guy so um my question would be is there any favorite quote that you have and that you would like to share with us Things. Well, I think, uh, as I said, like with with people who I consult, it's uh, it depends very much on the field that I'm trying to investigate. And with quotes, it's the same thing. It depends uh, which field of uh, our job or which field of life the it covers. I'm very huge fan of. Uh, uh, quotes on success so when it comes to uh, success uh, I, I follow maybe the best one that I found was John Wooden's uh, success is peace of mind which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best you are capable of becoming so for me that is that one is is really clear and says everything about about success so being successful is all about me not about comparing myself to the others and this is something that i truly truly uh, believe in i just want to go to bed and know that uh, i did something that day to become better and wake up happy and and ready to be even better than i was yesterday uh, I like one about uh, success uh, from uh, Widal Sasson, uh, who says the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. So uh, something that uh, I said uh, previously about being disciplined and, and uh, being a hard worker is uh, definitely one of the reasons people get success. Uh, so I think uh, work uh, is underpinning every every uh, success uh, and every successful person. Then uh, I think uh, there is one that it's kind of funny and not related uh, to me if you translate it uh, literally, but it says if you hang around barbershop long enough, sooner or later you are going to get a haircut. Uh, of course, uh, it does not apply to me. Uh, but uh, it applies uh, in my uh, daily work and being, uh, being ready and being uh, uh, patient uh, when, when it comes to things that I'm uh, 
looking for and things that I want to achieve. Uh, as I said, if you surround yourself with successful people, uh, there is a great chance that you will uh, be successful. So I think uh, if you work towards uh, something and uh, on a daily basis uh, you focus on uh, small goals, eventually uh, small goals will provide you a big goal and big achievement. Uh, from Stephen Covey, when it comes to communication, uh, something that I have stressed throughout this interview many times, seek first to understand, then to be understood. I think it's, it's a principle of, of communication. Uh, when it comes to uh, knowledge and respect, uh, Bruce Lee has a br brilliant one. Knowledge will give you power, but character respect. And this is something that is definitely important in our daily work. Uh, another one about communication. If you think communication is all talking, you haven't been listening. That's a great one. And for me, uh, as we work in the environment where we have a lot of people involved and changes can happen from minute to minute, I think it's very important to ask questions uh, rather than uh, making assumptions. So Mark Twain said it, it is wiser to find out than to suppose. So I think it's, it's a brilliant uh, quote to consider in everyday work. Guys, uh, with this we finish this interview. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, episode. As I said, due to coronavirus, uh, we are in the quarantine and I had to uh, come up with an idea how to uh, maintain the schedule that I promised. Uh, every three to four weeks new episode on my youtube channel if uh, you like this episode don't forget to share it uh, if you like the content on my youtube channel you can uh, follow it uh, however uh, next episode will uh, probably going to be with another live guest uh, right here or in some other place because uh, in the next couple of uh, days or weeks uh, we will finish the quarantine and i will give my best to uh, find a guest and record another episode of one-on-one -on -one interviews. Have a good day, have a good evening and see you soon. Bye-bye.